In this video, I'm going to go through the lecture slides for lecture 29 on methodological issues. Normally, this lecture would have taken place in the first week of May after the Easter vacation. And by this stage, I would have covered all the technical material for the module and I will be looking at material that tried to draw this together and give it some context. Um, with this in mind, there's two main parts to this lecture. First, I talk about Lima's typology of specification searches. This is based on a book by Edward Lima that was published in the late 70s or early 80s where he talks about the way in which people actually do econometrics and the reasons why they adopt the kind of models they do. I find this actually still very interesting even to this day. Um, after that I consider what I call some guilty secrets of econometrics and this is mostly about the sort of tricks that people either use to, um, uh, to make models appear better than they are or in some cases unconsciously um, adopt models because they don't realise that there are flaws with them that make them appear to perform better than they actually deserve. Anyway, let's take a look at the slides. The first point to talk about is Lima's idea about what constitutes a specification search and the reason why people do them. And to do that, he uses an example, the market for oranges in the United States. And uh, this is an example I tend to use quite a bit in my own lectures. But um, he starts off with a basic bit of theory. Um, it, it's a demand curve. We've got a log linear demand curve here where demand is a function of income and price and a random error term UI. And as usual, what we're interested in doing is estimating the parameters of this equation, in particular the slope parameters beta and gamma, which are the income and price elasticities re uh, respectively. Um, what he has is a cross-section sample of 150 households and he estimates this equation and he gets pretty reasonable looking results. An income elasticity of 0.85 with a standard error of 0.21, so it's quite significant, and a price elasticity of 0.67 with, again, a standard error of 0.13, so again, that's pretty significant. So, he then tries to motivate this by looking at the way in which people try to um, improve the model, try to adapt it. And to do that, he introduces what he calls a typology of specification search. And he divides the reasons why, or the, the things that people do to the models, into six different categories. There's what he calls hypothesis testing searches, interpretive search, and simplification search, and then followed by proxy search, data selection search, and post data, post -data model construction. We're going to consider all these things. Now, in terms of what we've talked about already, um, one to three can be thought of as general to specific approaches because they tend to start with an unrestricted model and then test restrictions that are imposed or generated by theory or are necessary to improve the performance of the model. And then four to six are more specific to general because they involve modifying an original model by introducing new or alternative variables. So let's take a look at how these work in practice. First of all, we we'll talk about hypothesis testing search. Now, a familiar hypothesis is that of a unit price elasticity of demand. So the test here would be a null hypothesis that gamma equals minus one against the alternative that gamma is not equal to minus one. Okay, straightforward thing to do in this case. So if we um, impose the restriction gamma equals minus one and re-estimate, our equation now takes this form because we can add log p to both sides because the coefficient is minus one and we get this equation here. The restrictions are derived from economic theory and they have the effect of simplifying the model. But they're not just arbitrary restrictions, you know, we can actually justify them from theory. Now in this case, if we test that restriction, then the test would involve a test on the unrestricted model and it, we could do a t-test. We could take minus 0.67, minus minus 1, divided by 0.13. That would give a t-statistic of 2.54. Now at the conventional 5% significance level, we would have rejected the null hypothesis here. So we would probably have concluded 
that this restriction was not justified. Next we talk about a data selection search. Now what do we mean by this? Well in this case what he's looking at is the difference between subsamples of the data and he divides up the sample into northern and southern households to see if the behaviour is different and he estimates separate regression equations um, for the two and you see here that we do in fact get quite different price elasticities the price elasticity of demand for northern households is much lower than that for southern households I don't know the United States economy too well so I don't know exactly why this should be the case but there is definitely a difference between these subsamples. The point here is that the theoretical specification of the model doesn't change. What we're doing is we're not examining alternative economic theories, we're examining alternative data sets and we're saying is this relationship robust across different subsamples or different data sets. Another thing he investigates is proxy variable search and one of the arguments here is that we, we use proxies for the variables that enter our regression equations. The income variable um, is household income or reported income of households and the argument here is that this may not actually be a pretty good, uh, this may not be a good proxy. Um, many reasons for that, um, you know, reported income is often distorted because people don't report their exact income uh, for tax purposes and so he investigates using an expenditure, total expenditure series rather than income as a scale variable in the equation. So with that he gets the equation given here okay, and you can see again it's changed the parameter estimates a bit the income elasticity has gone up quite a bit, it was below one before, it's now above one and the price elasticity has gone down a bit. Now these proxy variable search involves using the same theoretical model but different proxy variables on the right hand side. It's an attempt to see whether or not the results are robust to whatever proxies are being used. It does increase the fit of the model in, sense of, in the sense of increasing the coefficient of deter the determination and the T ratio on the coefficients, um, but it's hard to draw any real conclusion from this other than to say, well, it does actually matter which proxies you use. Another issue he considers is what he calls pulse data model construction. And this is where we try and improve a model by bringing in extra explanatory variables. So he tries, for example, to include um, the price of a competing good, grapefruits, in his demand for orange curve. And this is the result we get here, where we introduce the price of grapefruits, pi. And the interesting thing here is that the, both the price of oranges and the price of grapefruits both become insignificant. You see that the coefficient divided by the T ratio here in both cases will be quite a lot less than the 5% critical value. The other point is that both the price variables now have the wrong signs or are insignificant in this model. Um, no, uh, he does draw a distinction here between a model which included the price of grapefruit as a part of the theory and one which simply introduces it to improve the empirical performance of an estimated model. Although this has in fact increased the R squared a little bit, um, it's arguably made the model worse in the sense that the fit to theory is, um, is, is very bad now with the pr both price elasticities having the wrong sign. Okay, now another type of search he discusses is what he calls an interpretive search and this is where we try to um, perhaps fix the model um, with the, uh, that we've just estimated which had the wrong signs on the elasticities by imposing alter other restrictions. Okay, so what he tries here is what he calls the homogeneity restriction where the sum of the coefficients on income and prices is restricted to equal zero. So we take the sum of the three coefficients and those should, um, according to the theory, um, uh, have sum equal to zero. He imposes this restriction here um, and it does improve it, the match to theory in the sense that all coefficients now have the correct signs. Um, the restriction here is to improve the match between theory and the empirical model. It's not because we want to test the theory. We're using the theory here to improve the model rather than testing the theory. 
Okay, another type of search is what he calls a simplification search. And this is kind of like the idea of the um, general to specific approach we talked about in the previous lecture, where we were looking at restrictions on the model as a way of obtaining a more parsimonious specification, of reducing the number of parameters we estimate, and therefore improving the efficiency of the estimates of the remaining parameters. So in that previous model, we saw that the coefficients on income and the own price were nearly equal and opposite in sign, while that on the price of grapefruit was close to zero. If we were to impose those restrictions, in this case we do that, we impose those restrictions, we get a demand curve where demand is a function of the ratio between expenditure and price here with a single coefficient now doing the work of the three coefficients in the previous model. And um, uh, this seems to fit reasonably well. The R squares here don't change very much in any of these things. This is basically an example of restrictions which have been imposed to obtain a simple model for prediction and forecasting. We're not really interested in them from a theoretical point of view. We're simply interested in the way of obtaining a, a simpler model. Okay, now, different types of search have got different implications. Suppose we start with original model here where we've got both x and z variables and we um, move to a new model in which we exclude the z variable. With a hypothesis testing search the decision to go with the new model is equivalent to saying that gamma is equal to zero is a valid null hypothesis. We test the null hypothesis if it's true we move to this model. With an interpretive search, the decision to go with a new model is equivalent to saying that excluding Z gives a model which is a better match to the theory. So what we're trying to do is um, match the model to the theory, and by excluding the Z variable, we get a model which is easier to interpret. Again, it's not the same thing as a hypothesis testing search. Um, with a hypothesis testing search, it's simply whether or not the data rejects or accepts the hypothesis. With an interpretive search, it's whether or not the, um, the hypothesis gives you a better fit to the theory. Finally, with a simplification search, the decision to go with the new model is equivalent to saying that if we want to predict Y, it's better to exclude Z than to include it. Okay, We get a better, um, a more precise estimate, and we get a better prediction by this process. Okay, so that's Lima's approach. Um, it, it's an interesting approach. Um, you know, if we go back to the start of it here, um, I think what Lima's trying to do is he's trying to say how do econometricians actually behave? What is it they're doing when they um, start off with a model, they make changes to it, and then they present you with their final preferred model? And what they actually do depends upon what their objectives are. Okay, they may want to get a um, just simply present the simplest model they can. They may want to present a model which is as consistent with an economic theory as they can. They may want to present a model which is the best model for predicting or forecasting. So there are all sorts of reasons why they do what they do and um, it, when we read a paper, when we look at the models they present, what we ought to be doing is saying, well, you know, what are, the, what are their objectives here? Um, because the model they end up with is not neutral to those objectives. It depends upon what they want to do. Okay, so having looked at Lima's um, argument, what I want to do now is to move on to, um, I think, less about what economists, uh, economists use econometrics for, more about what economists abuse econometrics for. In a sense, um, uh, things that um, econometricians often do um, which they shouldn't do, which, um, uh, you know, well, what I call the guilty secrets of econometrics. And I've divided these up into three things. Basically, the first point I want to make is that economic significance and statistical significance are not the same thing. They're often presented as it the same. You'll often hear people refer to, well, such and such a variable is significant. Um, it, do we mean that it it's important, um, that it actually makes a big difference to the model we estimate? Do they mean that it satisfies some sort of narrow statistical criterion? And these are not the same thing, as we'll see in a minute. 
The second is that econometricians often go in for what's known as data mining, of trying to get, extract the best possible model from a data set. And that's kind of what Lima was talking about, and to some extent is what we talk about when we talk about general to specific analysis. And one of the points we need to make here is that data mining, of starting with general models and modifying them, um, often produces reported levels of significance which are not the same as the, as the uh, theory suggests. And finally, I want to make the point that many apparently significant relationships are really what we call spurious regressions. And again, this is something you'll have come across in your own work when you looked at your equations for your assignment, I have no doubt whatsoever. Okay, let's start off with the first of those topics, economic and statistical significance. Basically, when we talk about a test being statistically significant, we've got a very precise idea of what that means. We say um, a variable is significant if we can reject the null hypothesis that its coefficient is zero, say, at a given level of significance. That's a very different thing from saying that a result is economically significant, because economic significance means does it actually matter? Does it, uh, you know, does that variable actually um, contribute to explaining um, uh, a phenomenon of interest? A result is economically significant if it has an important influence on economic behaviour. And these two things, as we say, are very, very different. So let's look at some examples to just illustrate this. These are just things I've um, thought up out, um, uh, on the spot. They're not really uh, from any particular data set, but they do, I think, help illustrate the point. First of all, suppose we're interested in estimating the income elasticity of consumption. That's a pretty standard macro type thing to do. What we do is we'd run a regression of log consumption on log income and then take the slope coefficient as a measure of the income elasticity of consumption. And we're often interested in testing whether or not that is um, uh, equal to one because you know in many models um, there's a prediction that you know one percent rise in income produces an equivalent one percent rise in consumption. Now let's take a look at these two hypothetical regressions. In the first one, the slope coefficient is 0.99, but for whatever reason we've got perhaps got lots of data, we've got um, the nature of the data um, is such that we've got a very tight estimate of that uh, parameter. So our standard error is 0 0.0025. If we did a t-test for the hypothesis that um, the slope is equal to 1 from equation 1, then the test statistic will be minus four and thus we conclude the income elasticity was statistically different from one despite the fact it's equal to 0.99. In the second case we've got a much less precise estimate. Um, we've got a slope coefficient of 0.75 but the standard error is rather higher at 0.25. Now in the second case a t-test for the null hypothesis beta equals one would give a test statistic of minus one. Thus the income elasticity would not be statistically different from 1 in equation 2, despite the fact you can see the slope coefficient is much further away from 1. And if we were to impose the restriction that the co um, slope coefficient was equal to 1, it was probably not going to make much difference in equation 1 for the purposes of modelling. It would make a big difference in equation 2. In other words, the difference is economically significant in equation 2, but it's not statistically significant. So I think when we talk about whether an, the difference between economic and statistical significance, we're really talking about does it make a difference when we impose a restriction? Okay, let's move on to the other topic, data mining. Now, data mining um, is something that refers to the process of searching a data set for correlations between variables. And the problem here is that by the very nature, by nature of statistical testing, we're always going to find significant correlations if we investigate enough pairwise comparisons of data. The problem we have is for purposes of um, estimating equations is if we find a correlation between two variables by investigating or uh, checking out a whole load of possible correlations, we can't then go on and use the same data set to test the significance of that correlation. 
For example, suppose we regress a variable of interest on 100 different explanatory variables. Even if all of these are completely unrelated to the variable of interest, we'd expect to find five significant relationships if we use a 5% level of significance. If we use 100 different um, explanatory variables, then the 5% level of significance means we accept being wrong in 5% of the cases, and we'd expect to find, therefore, five significant relationships. So therefore, if we then um, test the relationship based on the, uh, just the pairwise comparison of those variables, this is not a valid test. If we wish to test a relationship detected through data mining, we need to do so using a new data set. We need to take the um, relationship we've identified and estimated, then apply it to a different data set and see whether or not it's robust. And that's perfectly possible to do, but it's very rarely done in um, applied econometric analysis. Let's just look at a quick example of this. What I've done here is just generate some random data and I've generated random data on a variable y and then I've taken uh, 10 independent random variables x and then I've run 10 different regressions and down the column here I've listed the t ratios that I obtained using those 10 different regressions and you see that of those 8 give me t ratios that are well below 2 so that we correctly say there was not a significant relationship between y and x and two actually give me t ratios which on the five percent level of significance i would be concluding there is a significant relationship now suppose what i do is then say okay i'm going to take the best possible relationship i've got which is the one where i get a t ratio of three estimate that regression which is shown here and then conclude yes there is indeed a um, significant relationship between this variable y and this other variable x we've got a significant result but we've done it by choosing the best possible results from a whole series of regressions we've run in other words we've been indulging in the process of what we call cherry picking cherry picking the dictionary definition of this uh, phrase is the activity of pursuing the most lucrative, advantageous or profitable among various options and leaving the less attractive ones for others. That's what we're doing here. We're taking a whole series of different regressions, we're choosing the best possible one. We can make this a little bit more technical. Suppose we adopt a critical value which implies a probability P of making a type 1 error, i.e. rejecting the null when the null is true. If we run k regressions, then the probability that we correctly accept the null in all k cases is 1 minus p to the power k. We have to uh, reject the null in every one of those k, uh, sorry, we have to accept the null in every one of those k cases. So 1 minus p to the power k tends to 0 as k tends to infinity. So it follows that if we run enough regressions, we'll event inevitably, in the end, reject the null in at least one of those. We can then cherry pick that regression and claim a significant result. My suspicion about a lot of the modern fashion for what's known as big data is that a lot of big data operates in exactly this way. It considers lots and lots of possible correlations and then just cherry picks the best ones. Um, this is okay provided it's an investigative approach and the, you then go on to test whether or not the relationships you identify are robust, but by itself is likely to lead. Spurious regressions. Again, it's worth going to the dictionary for a definition of what's meant by the word spurious. Spurious is an adjective. It means not genuine, authentic or true, not from the claimed, pretended or proper source, a counterfeit. And a spurious regression is an apparent relationship between variables which appear significant but which does not reflect a genuine association. So you can see, for example, we can arrive at a spurious regression by the process of cherry picking the data. We sometimes think of spurious regressions as arising by accident, but the definition does in fact suggest a deliberate attempt to deceive. Now, one of the most common reasons for spurious regressions is the presence of what are known as unit roots um, in data series, or alternatively, to simplify a little, 
Um, if we have series that contain a random walk element, it can produce this type of result. What we mean by that, a series like this, where we've got yt equals yt minus 1 plus ut and xt equals xt minus 1 plus epsilon t. These are examples of what's known as random walk processes. They're not stationary. And as a result, a lot of the standard statistical um, results don't apply with these types of series. In particular, what we find is that if we take independent random walk series like this, where these are just completely independent processes with shocks, ut and epsilon t, um, which are not correlated with each other, we still tend to get very high degrees of correlation. For example, what I've done here is construct realizations of these processes using the random number generator in eViews. What I've done is generate um, random process Y, which is given by this blue line here, and a random process X given by the red line. These are independent of each other. Okay, there's no co uh, no correlation between the processes generating the data. But if we do a regression of one random walk series on another, here we regress y on a constant and x, we get an apparently very significant result with a t-risk statistic of 11 here. Where you tend to see the, find um, these out is you get this combination of um, very significant variables, uh, quite a high r squared here at 0.55, and a very low Durbin-Watson statistic because what we'll find is that um, this type of model, although we get apparently high correlation, it also tends to produce high degrees of serial correlation. Just to illustrate how important this is, what I've done here is an example of a Monte Carlo simulation where I've run 10,000 regressions of independent random walk processes Y on independent random walk processes X. So I've just generated random walk processes and run regressions 10,000 times. Doing that, I found 66.8% of the time I got an apparently significant T ratio. Um, uh, the Durbin-Watson statistic average value was 0.33, so in most cases we're finding significant autocorrelation. The R squared was 0.22. Okay. This actually is an attempt to replicate a set of results from a classic paper in econometrics by um, Clive Granger and Paul Newbold that was published in the Journal of Econometrics in 1974. It's called Spiritual Regressions in Econometrics. And I think it's fair to say this is where ec most econometricians became aware that this was a really serious problem. What we're not saying is that you should never regress one unit root process on another. There may be cases in which this is a valid thing to do and it generates interesting results. What we are saying is you have to be very careful in interpreting the results when you do this and you shouldn't just take the regressions at face value and certainly you shouldn't be taking the T ratios and the significance level at face value. Just to point out that those were just simple random walks if we introduce drift terms into the random walk, in other words, we don't just have, um, say, xt dependent on xt minus 1, but we add a constant to that relationship, so every time period it will increase by a certain factor, the problem becomes even worse. If we add drift terms here for the y and x processes, then we get to a situation in which 99.7% of the time we get apparently significant t ratios. So um, again, this is concerning because so many economic time series, um, say macroeconomics, are actually pretty well approximated by random walk with drift. So this you know, is more like the rule than the exception when it comes to macroeconomic data. This is one of the reasons why time series analysts often advocate difference in the data prior to estimation. The problem with that is that it eliminates potentially useful long run information from the data set. Not something we can really go into on this course because it's too, um, you know, it's, it's rather technically demanding. But if you go on to do the applied uh, econometrics option um, next year, you'll probably find that this is one of the topics that's covered in some detail.
Another point we need to make, and again, this is relates to the idea of spurious regressions, is that modelling does require some knowledge of the context of data as well as statistical technique. And the point I'm trying to make here is that structural breaks in the data can produce, for, first of all, they can produce um, uh, uh, apparently spurious regressions. They can also produce um, uh, the appearance of serial correlation. Okay. Let me just consider an example here. Um, this is an example where, <coughs> excuse me, I've created a data set um, by in, um, in two parts. In the first part, yt equals 0.5 xt plus ut. In the second part, yt equals 2 plus 0.5 xt plus ut. In other words, I've deliberately created a data set with a structural break. Now, if we do a straightforward regression of y and x using all 200 observations here, we actually don't do too badly in estimating the slope coefficient 0.44, but the, F, um, the constant term is an average of the constant term in the two subperiods, 0 in the first period, 2 in the second period. But the other problem this creates is that it produces failure in a number of the diagnostic test statistics. In particular, what we get is failure of the Durbin-Watson test. We get the Durbin-Watson statistic of 0.94. It makes it appear as if there's significant serial correlation. The danger with this is that if we don't know the context of the data, if, we don't, if we're not aware that there is a structural break or we don't allow for the possibility, we end up correcting for the wrong problem. We end up correcting for serial correlation and potentially producing an equation which looks quite good, which fits the data quite well, but is misleading because we've dealt with the wrong problem. Okay. Again, to illustrate this, these are the residuals from the regression model that I've just presented to you. Um, the residuals are generally um, in the negative region for the first 100 observations and in the positive region here for the next. Okay. Before the structural break, we've got negative residuals. After it, the residuals are positive. So what we'll apparently see is some sort of correlation between each residual and its pre value in the previous period. In other words, serial correlation. If we try to correct for that, we might get a regression like this. This is done using autoregressive least squares. I've estimated a, um, an AR1 term in the regression equation, and I get an apparently significant autoregressive um, term in my regression equation which then fits the data really rather well. Um, Durbin Watson goes to 2.14 so it, it doesn't do too badly okay but we uh, we're addressing the wrong problem here. A better solution would have been to deal with the structural break by including a dummy variable in the regression equation. So what I've done here is create a dummy variable which is zero prior to the break, one after the break and now when I estimate my regression equation, I get, again, the correct slope coefficient, but I now get a significant dummy variable in the second period, and that, at the same time, corrects the apparent problem of serial correlation. So I get a Durbin-Watson statistic of 1.84. Okay, So we have to be fairly careful about what problem we're actually addressing. Okay, well that's it for this lecture and I've got one further lecture to go which I'll be recording at a later date.